It's the most often repeated story in whiskey. In 1823, distilleries were finally able to get licenses to be able to make their spirit legitimately. But they still had a problem. The majority of their new audience was out in the cities, far away. They needed a way of getting their whiskey to them. In the 19th century, Scotland was industrialising. And a huge part of that was connecting everything up with shiny new railways. And a new spirit of symbiosis was born, that of steam and of spirit together. The whisky distilleries were able to get their raw materials in and their finished whiskies away to market. And it's this era that we want to pay tribute to with the Cask 88 Scotch Whisky Express series. Named for the high-speed trains that once connected England and Scotland, the Scotch Whisky Express comprises five bottles, representing the five great Victorian Scottish railway companies and five distilleries that were located within their catchment areas. The Highland Railway was represented by Blair Athol, the Great North of Scotland represented by Ben Rinnis, and the North British by the Fettercairn Distillery. Now, I'm not sure if I get to be more excited today because I'm finally unveiling the identity of the last two bottles of the series, or because I get to play with a full-size train in order to do so. Ah, and now I found exactly the collection of people that I'd hoped to find on this special steam service. People who, with various fields of expertise, can help me bring to life the final two bottles in the Scotch Whiskey Express series. With me now, I have John Gill, the chairman of the Caledonian Railway, Robin Barnes, the artist who created these fine labels for our bottles, and Moa Nielsen, aka Swedish Whiskey Girl, who is a vlogger, YouTuber, expert in whiskey and the fashions of times gone by. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. I don't think we are going to truly understand the topic at hand today until I introduce these whiskies. So, the fourth in the Scotch Express series from Ochentoshan Distillery, representing the Glasgow and South Western Railway. We have this little 10-year-old Ochentoshan, triple distilled, nice and smooth, I hope. The motion of the train is not making this easy for me. The reason why we are here on this Caledonian Railway special steam service today is the final in the series is the Caledonian Railway itself. The true line, as they always wanted to be known. And since the Caledonian Railway did serve the town of Dune, which is famously home to Deanston Distillery, and that's what we have here, a 15-year-old Deanston for the Cali. The gentleman to your, your best help, Slangeva. Yeah, why not? <laughs> So I say we're on the Caledonian Railway now. It's not exactly the same as the Caledonian Railway of the Victorian era. So what is this Caledonian Railway, John? We're, we're here on the Caledonian Railway in Brecon. This is a branch line off the main Strathmore main line. And we now operate it as a heritage tourist attraction. It's sort of northeast of Scotland here between Dundee and Aberdeen. So we're being hauled by a, a steam locomotive right now. I'd say one of the very iconic ones, something that is beloved by many and known as a puggy, affectionately. Yes, the, the, the pugs were very typical given we're here speaking about whiskey. They were used a lot of uh, whiskey distilleries and small industrial sites for uh, shunting wagons together for, for feedstock that came into the facilities, so coal and, and, and wheat for the likes of the distilleries and uh, taking away the whiskey themselves once it was gone. So the, the local that's pulling us today was built in 1926 by a Scottish company called Andrew Barclay. And we now use it for, it's an ideal size for us for just small, small number of coaches on the train. It makes lovely noises like that, just on cue. It's very charming. <laughs> it is, it's a lovely sound. Isn't it? it is. Well, we're in a, a lovely bit of um, very sort of Scottish agricultural landscape here. Whereabouts are we in Scotland? We're, we're in the northeast of Scotland, between Dundee and, Ab Dundee and Aberdeen. So it was very traditionally agricultural. The railways were used a lot, so particularly this branch existed because mm. of the need for agriculture. So a lot for uh, lime and coal was taken to Brecon for the, the two distilleries that were locally, uh, but also for you know coal was heavily used in a lot of a lot of things then, and lime was heavily used by the farmers. Very agricultural area, and and it also allowed people to travel a lot further. You know, distances that would previously have taken days or weeks yeah. could be done in hours or a small number of days. So you were able to go to the seaside for the day rather than you know. So it, it did 
it did open up the world to a lot of people. You know, it was, it was that's that's one thing we really are focusing on with this series, with the sort of partnership between railways and whiskey, how the world opened up in the Victorian era when all these things were being constructed. So, Moa, you're kind of a historian in yourself and you like you, you look back at these sort of previous eras. Is the Victorian era one of particular interest to you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Industrial Revolution might not sound super romantic, but when you think about it, like you said, when the railway came about, it opened up the world for people. It was so much many, like so many ideas that could spread, and so many people that could meet in another way. And even just for the whiskey industry, being able to move your whiskey out into the world and then take in ingredients as well, it's. It's really fascinating to look back on the time. Is there kind of an inevitable connection when you get into whiskey that you start looking at things historically? I think so. I think if you do like whiskey and you get a little bit into it, you do appreciate the time it takes to make whiskey. And I think in society today, there's a lot of people that are so fast paced. They look at food, clothing, just whatever you have in your home and it's fast manufactured and you can get a hold of it quickly and you can get rid of it quickly but I think a lot of people nowadays and especially I think if you appreciate whiskey you appreciate that some things can take the time and appreciate the craftsmanship behind it. But I guess at the time these trains would have been able to move things faster than anything would have previously. We've named our series the Scotch Express after the links between um, Scotland and London were made by train. I don't know Robin if um, the sort of that the Scotch Express has particular meaning for you as an entity? Well, I did travel between Scotland and London frequently in the days of steam, yes. Mm. Uh, but of course, Scot Scotch Express was the term used for any express between England and Scotland in the 19th century. Uh, not Scots, it was the Scotch Express. Just, just the location we're in as well is quite fascinating because the, the races to the north culminated just yeah. not very far away from here. So in, in 1895, when some of these railways knew North British and Caledonia particularly, yeah. east coast and main line, east, east and West Coast main lines came together at Bridge of Dunn, and just, just yeah, just the two of them just in shot, just just north of Bridge of Dunn. And in those days, this is 1895. Remember, the average speed on when they were racing was over 60 miles an hour. So that includes station stops. And you know, you think about average speed from London all the way to Aberdeen mm. to be over 60 miles an hour in 1895 is quite an incredible feat. It's quite interesting that the Industrial Revolution kind of made things go faster and yeah. now when we're here going a little bit slower maybe we have a need in the community to go a little bit slower again the, you know the railways were known especially in this era for their sort of you know the, the, the particularly nice interiors and, and very mm. kind of you know it was, it was a lot to do with marketing in terms of how they yeah i think some of the most comfortable trains ever really were just at the end of the 19th century i mean the the, the west coast joint stock yes from Houston to Carlisle to Edinburgh and Glasgow, absolutely well, I understand superb. that was kind of the specialty of the um, Glasgow and South Western. They knew that they couldn't compete with some of these other companies in terms of the area they covered, but they did invest in being like one of the most comfortable uh, services. Well, the North British was considered worthy but dull. <laughs> <laughs> But it was a big railway and it served Scotland well. But yeah, the, yeah glamour was the Cali. I mean, the Caledonian just helped itself to the Royal Court of Arms, yes, didn't it? Yes, exactly, <laughs> just went, we'll have that. It's, it's interesting, because we're on one of the few bits where there was there was joint operating. Yeah. Brecon Station, often they would build competing stations quite close together, but Brecon yeah. Station was a joint station. It was a Cali station. North British were allowed to use it. <laughs> We've chosen a distillery that was in the catchment area of each company. Um, how much do you think those whiskey distilleries benefited from the direct links to the railways? Most importantly, the whiskey had to be released to the market. Yep. And the reality was that while whiskey is good when it's aged, you don't want it to take five years to get to the people you're selling it to. So the ability to put it on a train and get that far and wide. And, and, and it was, yeah, as I was talking about the Industrial Revolution, the, you know, steamships and things as well. So it wasn't, we're not just talking about UK, we're talking about there were much better links between the railways and, and, and steamships at the time as well. So actually getting getting whiskey abroad as well, not, not just within the UK, but actually outside. So and You can see a lasting effect now. Even in Scotland, a lot of people would say that Speyside might be one of the biggest. I mean, it is a very big whiskey region, but it's one of the most popular and one of the ones that are really known worldwide. And the reason that they were able to establish so many distilleries that are still there today is that they could use the train. During the Industrial Revolution when Britain really grew, basically. If you just look on the map, where, where do you get the train from ever? Yeah. yeah, straight up. Yeah. It's interesting as well because, as you say, Speyside and Isla 
traditionally very well known for, for, for whiskey country, but lots of Scotland's got, you know, Brecon's a tiny, you know, it's, it's a tiny town. It's got less than 10,000 people. It had two whiskey distilleries. It still has one. It was served by the railway. Mm. Uh, whiskey tastings on a train, it's it's a bit sort of um, noisier and bumpier than I was envisaging, but how do you find these whiskeys taste when they are now served in their in their proper place on their train? Well, I think the movement's actually helping the flavour. <laughs> yeah, releasing all the aromas, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I find it very moreable, if you like. <laughs> It's so enjoyable. I think when you have this kind of view as well, and you have a whiskey that has a little bit of a malty character, it's it's almost like you're drinking these your surroundings. Mm. I mean, I can see you know the stubble is here from barley fields. A lot of this barley will have gone straight to Scottish distilleries, probably yeah. some local ones. But they're, they're, the 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 whiskies that, that we're tasting today, they're quite similar in style in that they've both been matured in ex bourbon casks. But the Ochentoshan is ten years matured. The Deanston is 15 years, so you'll get that difference there with the extra five years of spending time in oak and developing kind of those flavors you'd associate with oak. But you also have the distillery's character. So Deanston may be a little weightier, has sort of a slightly spirity, slightly nutty note. Ochentoshan, known uh, as a triple distilling distillery, um, where they, they run their spirit an extra time, which just lightens it up a little. Maybe you get a little bit of extra sort of gentle fruitiness, a little banana, uh, those vanilla notes sing a little more. Um, I wonder if you sort of compare them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think the Ochentoshan has a yeah. bit more of a, a green malt, but then that kind of youthfulness to it. Where the Deanston is a little bit oilier and has like a little bit more weight, but they're both quite malty. Mm. I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're just simple. We're just simple whiskey drinkers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, like, I like the flavour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robin, you know, without, uh, without your artwork, this whole series would not have existed. And I would like to know um, about how you chose each of these five locomotives when you first approached this project. Well, having had the railway companies chosen, uh, I then decided, well, what locomotives actually would people identify with? What were the most famous? Not necessarily the best, but the really iconic machines. I mean, this Caledonia one, for example, these used to attract huge crowds at the end of the platform just to watch them go. I mean, yeah. uh, and the drivers were public figures. We well, those are lovely little engines. They were designed by uh, Joe, Joe David Jones, I think, wasn't it? Who was the locomotive superintendent of the Highland Railway for a long time. And they're very simple. They were tough as nails, absolutely suited to the rough and tumble of the Highland Railway. I mean, you know, and I, th I think the oldest example of the locomotives that we have here, most of these are sort of later in the railway's lives. Yeah, this one is yeah, that's 1890s, I think. 1890s. Mm. Uh, and then for the North British, we have quite a powerful oh, one on the, the fourth the, bridge. These are the, the great Atlantis, Audrey and Dunedin and uh, Aberdonian. Yeah, they hauled the trains from Edinburgh North to Aberdeen in the 20th century. Oh, they were very impressive, yes. Um, for, for Speyside, for our Ben Rinnis, um, I mean, the, the well, Speyside that, that, Railways, the Great North of Scotland, there's well, not. Well, the Great North of Scotland's interesting, really, because it only used, ever, ever used that wheel arrangement for its, uh, apart from a few shunting engines, the, the 440, it never used anything else. And then uh, around, uh, we have something a little squatter for the, well, uh, the Glasgow and South Western. Well, this was just a personal fancy, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because these big uh, white leg tank engines, I don't think they were that good. And they were a kind of engine which never really caught on in Britain, a big, fast express tank engine. They were to take people from Glasgow down to air. And they were extremely expensive. They were built right at the end of the Glasgow and South Western Railway's individual life. Yeah, so we're, 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 we're clearly having a pretty wonderful time here um, and a huge part of that is that we are currently being pulled by a small puggy on a railway but that takes me to the most philosophical of my questions why do people love trains I think because the steam locomotive is the one of man's inventions which comes nearest to being a living thing because it really lets you know what it's doing. Yeah. If it's in a bad temper, you know. <laughs> well, you'll know this. I mean, it, it fusses and puffs and blows out steam. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's irresistible. And you, you only have to watch, especially if you happen to be on a, a main line 
excursion when she's is people stop yeah. and they wave and they smile mm. and wave. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the pure yeah. simplicity of the machine, as yeah. you say, it is, it is very close to being a living thing, yeah. isn't it? It's got, yeah. it's not, it's not entirely predictable. Yeah, it you has know, bad you're, moods, you're, doesn't exactly, it? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just, just days um, when it when it refuses yeah. to sort of. Yeah. That's not like a coal fire in your house, you know. It, it never worked well, <laughs> well in days have gone days yeah. gone by, you know. It's, it's I mean, I can always speak for myself, but also the way of travelling on a train, you can bring your luggage on and you can sit down and then yeah. when you step off you're somewhere new but you can see your journey all the way yeah. and you can't do that when you're flying or no. it's not the same thing you just see clouds <laughs> which yeah. can be stunning but when you actually see the landscape and you see how it changes I think that's one of my favorite things just being able to watch that as it happens. I do appreciate that there will be some people uh, watching this who will be screaming at their screen enough with the trains I want to know a bit more about the whiskey and um, Moa you are here as Swedish uh, whiskey girl and whiskey is very much the focus of your channel you do a lot of whiskey reviews how does your channel work and where can people find you? Well you can find me by just searching for Swedish whiskey girl anywhere I am you'll find that <laughs> um, but it's yeah it, it's an interesting world and if you are looking for a little bit of a friendly and welcoming approach to whiskey. If you're looking for international whiskeys, Scotch whiskeys, just want to ask a question, then I would like to think I'm the place to go to. You've done, like us, quite a bit of traveling to visit different parts of Scotland and distilleries as well. Like the name says, I'm from Sweden. So yep. being over here, I have this brilliant opportunity of just exploring as much as I possibly can. Because where are the distilleries? They're quite remote. So I can go around all of Scotland, <laughs> see the distilleries and also see the rest of Scotland. Absolutely. And <laughs> now I have that experience under my belt where I can say I know how it is to sample a whiskey in motion on a steam train. I know how it is to combine the aroma of vanilla and coconuts with the um, the reek coming from the, the engine. So I will have to now say a great thank you to the whiskies that have got us here safely and in one piece and in a good mood. To John Gill, the chairman here at the Caledonian Railway, thank you so much for opening this up and maintaining it so well. Uh, thank you to Robin Barnes for the artworks that adorn the bottles and have helped this series to be what it is. Moa, aka Swedish Whiskey Girl, thank you for being just so into the world of whiskey, one foot in the past, one foot in the now. Uh, this is the point to like, subscribe, leave comments, uh, have your own opinion on which of the Caledonian and the North British was the, uh, the true railway. Thank you all for joining us. Slangeva. Slangeva. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, And there, the Scotch Whiskey Express series is complete with the final two bottles. The Glasgow and South Western Railway with Ochentoshan Distillery and the Caledonian Railway with Deanston. And we have to thank the real, still functioning Caledonian Railway up here in Brechin for letting us try our new bottles on their service. If you want to find these bottles for yourself and complete your collection, head on to cask88.com forward slash store. Until then, travel speedy, travel safe. <laughs>